God, this morning we do come to the altar. We come with our arms outstretched to you. We come because we know that your arms are outstretched to us. That you allow your love to fill us, to heal us, to give us your comfort and your peace. Lord, that is the message of your scriptures, the scriptures that we, we hold dear to our hearts. So, Lord, we pray that as we take this time together, that we, you allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart here be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So today is the day that we are concluding uh, the series that we started several weeks ago on the different covenants of Scripture. And if you remember, I said I, I've been wanting to do a series like this for a while just because it, it is so important for us to understand and, and to think and to know exactly what Scriptures are about, well, why, why we have these words. It's a reminder to us that sometimes we want to try to pull things out of scriptures that aren't there. I was listening to a podcast recently uh, with a couple of my favorite theologians, Brian Zahn and James Bryant Smith. Uh, they were talking about a book that Brian wrote, and they were talking about just some of the difficulties of scripture. And, and they were talking about how sometimes, as I said, we try to get the wrong things out of scripture. Scripture is not a textbook. Scripture is not a, a historical or scientific manual. But hopefully as we've gone through and we've talked about the covenants, we see that Scripture is about reconciliation. Scripture is about redemption. And when we take a look at Scripture as redemption, we can see that that is painted all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. Everything was, was beautiful. Everything was good. Not, not just good, but, but very good when God created. And then sin came into the world and, and, and tore all of that apart. And from that moment on, God was in, about the business of restoring what he had originally created. We can't fully understand the universal nature of God's love for the world without understanding what happened in Noah's covenant, the washing away of, of the sin and the evil in the world. We can't fully understand the nature of God's family without understanding the relationship that God had with Abraham. We, we can't fully understand the importance of Christ's holy life and atoning sacrifice without understanding what happened with Moses and, and the people of Israel there at Mount Sinai. And we can't fully understand the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ without understanding the covenant that God made with David, establishing the kingdom to be moved through his family line all the way to the birth of Jesus the Christ. All of these covenants build upon each other. All of these covenants paint a picture of redemption that, that comes to fruition through Jesus Christ. It comes to fruition in the new covenant. The new covenant doesn't wipe away the covenants that, were, that happened before, but, but it brings them all together, and it fits together the Old Testament with the New Testament. You know, it's an interesting thing about numbers. If you remember when we talked about Abraham and, and what happened between Joseph and Moses, that there was a 400-year period between the, uh, the, the Israelites going to Israel and finally their release from captivity. 
There's another 400-year period that we don't necessarily see in the Bible, but it's the period between the book of Malachi and the Gospels. So the 400 years that it took for the Israelites to be freed from their bondage and captivity, there was another 400-year period that, that God's people needed to be set free. And the way that they are set free is through the birth, the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. An interesting thing about the book of Malachi, it's a book that we don't really pay that much attention to. But, but one of the, the fascinating things about the book of Malachi is that it ends with a promise of Elijah proclaiming the day of the Lord. It ends looking back at, at what had happened in the Old Testament, but then it, it cast it in the light of, of something happening in the future. It, it cast it in the light saying that the story isn't over yet. That God is continuing to work and God is continuing to use the scriptures and using God's people for a mighty and wonderful task. So we have John the Baptist, which we've talked about before. And John the Baptist isn't Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. And he goes about to proclaim the coming of the Lord. And then when Jesus was born and then baptized by John the Baptist in, in the River Jordan, Jesus started in his ministry. And, and the thing that Jesus came to, to minister to and the thing that Jesus came to preach was about repentance and how we needed to turn from the ways of life that we were living into a new life, a new life in and with Christ. See, Christ didn't come just to get rid of the covenants that we have talked about before. If he did, then the past few weeks of the sermon series wouldn't have made that much sense. Why, why, why do we spend time thinking about it and, and, and talking about and, and looking at the past covenants that, that God had created? No, Christ came in order to, to fulfill those covenants. In, in Matthew chapter 5, 17, he even says these words. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I came to fulfill them. Now, uh, this little tag is, is right there at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and, and through the next three chapters, what he does, he, he takes these chapters, and he makes a, a case on how the law is, has been corrupted, how, how the law has been turned, and he says, you may have heard this, but I tell you something else. Or you may have heard this, and I, I tell you how this is to really be fulfilled in your life today. So Jesus knew the importance of the covenants and, and what, what God came and what God did through the, the patriarchs of, 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 the, of old, but he came to let us see that there was something more, that God was doing something through him so that we may be saved. We know that Jesus then marked this new covenant. It's something that we celebrate every month here at the Lord's table, where he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, a question may come, well, well, who is this covenant for? Who is this new covenant for? We, we, we see God active and, and working and alive within God's people of Israel, but, but, but maybe that's all that this covenant is for. And that's also not the case. Uh, the, the covenant that, that, that Christ established, this new covenant, is to be a blessing for the entire world. If you remember all the way back to Abraham, 
when, when Abraham told him that he would be a blessing, he, he not only said that you would be a blessing to the people of Israel, but you will be a blessing for the entire world. So the covenant of Abraham was, was made true within Jesus Christ. The atonement was made true. The, the atonement that was completed with the work of Moses was made true in Jesus Christ. And the kingdom that was established was made true for Jesus Christ, but that kingdom was then expanded to all people. Paul continued talking about the redemption of the world when he wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done by body, by human hands. Remember that at the times you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenships in Israel and foreigners in the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have always been brought near by the blood of Christ. But you know, it doesn't take the words of Paul to see that we who are Gentiles are accepted into this new covenant. We, we see this through the works of Jesus himself. That there are many healing stories that we see in scriptures where Jesus took time to heal the Gentiles around him. That took time to, to bless them and, and, and to bring them within the fold. From, from, from the guy who was suffering from many demons in the Gentile land that God freed, that Jesus freed from and, and took all of those demons and put them into a whole bunch of pigs and, and killed them. He was set free by God. For the centurion who had a, a slave that was near death, that, they, that came to Jesus and said, if you will just heal my servant, everything will be great. But you don't have to come to my house. If you just say the word, I know that he will be healed. From the woman whose daughter was sick and close to death, and came to Jesus, the Canaanite woman, and said, Lord, would you heal my daughter? And Jesus said, you know, I came for the people of Israel. And she said, look, even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. Could you give something to me? And Jesus not only healed her daughter, but he gave a blessing, saying that she knew more than the teachers of the law, how God had come to them. Now, we know that the leaders did not like this, they, they wanted to keep the promises of God to themselves. They didn't want to share that with others. But Jesus knew that this new covenant wasn't just for the Israelites, wasn't just for those who were in the know, but it was for all people and all nations. So, after hearing about all of these covenants, how do we live out these covenants that God has given us? First and foremost, and I think something that we must remember time and time again, that we are given the gift of salvation. That, that it is through these covenants that, that what was torn apart by sin is now brought back together. That, that, that this reconciliation that, that makes us one with the one who created us and loved us. Or as Romans 5, 10 says, For if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? We are no longer identified by the sin that is in our life. We are identified by the saving work 
of Jesus Christ. We are identified by the saving work of Jesus Christ through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. That is what gives us hope. That is what holds us together. That is what helps us to live fully in the reconciliation that God has for each and every one of us. And here's the part that I love. That through that reconciliation, we are now given rest. We can rest. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to try to earn the love and grace of Jesus Christ. There is absolutely nothing we can do to try to to make us in a better position now than we were back then. And there is nothing that we can do that can help us to move forward and to put us in a better condition later than we are right now. But the words that Jesus gives to us are the words that I think we all need to hear, is that we are come to rest in Christ. Or as he tells his disciples in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love how God works. I I love how God works. And the song that that Rod just sang before this message is the song that helps us to remember. Come to the altar. His arms are open wide for us so that we may find rest in him. And know that Christ's work was enough for us. It was, it is, and it always will be enough for us for us. It also reminds us that we will never be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We we will never have to deal with that separation because Christ's love filled that for us. Christ's love brought in this, this way for us to always be connected with God. A couple weeks ago, I preached a sermon up in Sherman, Texas, and one of the passages that I love to use during a sermon are these final words from Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, and I wanted to kind of conclude this series with these words. Paul writes, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor all the powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what the covenants do. The the covenants allow us to fully live in the power of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. So as we conclude the series, I hope that you have seen the full package of, of the work of restoration that God had worked through Scripture. That restoration is there for each and every one of us, for the sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. As we move into the season of Lent, we are going to look and see exactly what that means to be a co-heir of Jesus Christ as we explore what it takes to live a Jesus-shaped life. I hope that you are open to experience that and, and, and to do all that we can to live into that grace, to live into that hope, to live into that peace 
that we receive from Jesus Christ. Would you please pray with me? Oh Lord, we thank you for the many covenants that we see through scriptures. The covenants that reminds us that while we participate in the covenant, you are the main actor. You are the main actor throughout all of scripture. And it is through your love and through your grace and through your promises that we have life and have it abundantly. So Lord, let us remember that as an Abraham, we are called to be a blessing to the world around us. As in Moses, we are called to repentance, to live our lives fully in devotion to you. And as of David, you have given us a king, a king that guides us and leads us, a king that goes before us and gives us your peace. So Lord, we thank you for your love, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your power. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.